Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College, a program that encourages good discussion in our community on today's local and global issues. Now, your host for Conversations from St. Norbert College, author, professor, and nationally known sports economist, Dr. Kevin Quinn. Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College. I'm Kevin Quinn. Our special guest is Dean Emeritus, Dr. Michael Marsden, and we'll discuss his 46-year career in higher education. We'll also talk about this TV show, which he helped create nearly 10 years ago. Marsden, professor of English, American Studies, and Media Studies, arrived at St. Norbert College in 2003. He taught courses on popular entertainments, the automobile, and American culture. Marsden has been published widely in popular culture studies, with special emphasis on film, Western literature, regional culture, and popular entertainments. Mike, welcome to the program. Well, thank you, Kevin. Well, it's, well, I'm glad to be here. It's a, it's a real special treat for me to have you here because uh, this is your brainchild. And so let's start off by talking about how we got here. Why, how do we get this show? Well, I think uh, when, I, when I came to St. Norbert in 2003, I sat down with uh, a number of people, including uh, Bridget O'Connor, and talked about an idea that I had. Originally, we thought about this as a radio show, a possibility. And the reason for that was that my prior institution was Eastern Kentucky University. And the president, uh, uh, Bob Custer, who's now president of Boise State, had, his, had a radio show you know, that he uh, launched when he was at Eastern Kentucky, which was pretty much a conversation show about what was going on at the campus, guests, speakers, and so on. And it was uh, pretty successful. And prior to that, I had actually um, created and hosted a weekly television show for public television when I was at Bowling Green State. And I, um, I produced it for six years, and I uh, hosted it for five of the six years. And that was um, during the academic year. We ran that show just about every week, and it was, uh, it was a very interesting experience for me. And so when I got to St. Norbert, we talked about this with um, several people, but particularly Bridget O'Connor, and she in turn worked with uh, Mike Counter, who um, together came up with the idea of the cable television show and the distribution process being cable television as opposed to over the air. Um, and it made sense, and it was affordable, um, and we did a, a monthly show, which, which made it doable in terms of uh, working in into other responsibilities that I had at the institution. So, um, and, and it took off, and, and then, of course, you replaced me as host when I stepped down as, as dean. And um, I think the show has continued to reach out to just thousands and thousands of people in a very, uh, in a very effective way, I think. Um, and you're able to share a lot of significant visitors to the campus with a much broader audience than would ever be able to um, enjoy, you know, their perspectives and, and their experiences. And so I think over the years, it's also, by the way, and I'm sure you would agree with this, it is um, an extended liberal arts education for the host. I mean, you really have to prepare for the show and you have to uh, learn to deal with novelists and sports figures and uh, politicians. And so, you know, the range of guests forces you to really expand your horizons. So for me, it was a professional development opportunity, you know, and I miss that. I really do. Well, I, I feel the same way. I mean, it's it, one of the great things about this is getting to meet people from all over the world that I, I would never would have had an opportunity to sit down and, and talk with. Um, who are your... Most memorable, memorable guests. Or well, I think my, my final show was uh, Gwen Eiffel, you know, from mm -hmm. uh, from public television, and she was our commencement speaker, as you might recall. And we worked in a um, a taping um, uh, early one uh, Sunday morning, and it was uh, probably one of my favorite shows. But then there were others. I mean, uh, Steve Mariucci, uh, the show that we did with him, I think, has been probably rebroadcast more than anything else I've ever done. Um, and I thought that was a particularly successful show where he really focused in on, on the values that he holds um, in terms of his life, you know, where family and, and religion and football, how they all inter intertwine, but how some outrank others in terms of how he lives his life. And so it was a very, a very powerful show, I think. Um, well, you have connections then, to the UP where he's from. <laughs> he's from. He's from Iron Mountain, and, mm -hmm. um, you know, he was also a Northern Michigan grad. Um, as was Steve Izzo, uh, uh, so you know the two of them together, you know, graduated from from Northern at the same time and still remain lifelong friends. You know, uh, Tom Izzo, not Steve. Tom right. Izzo, <laughs> sorry. And uh, but they're but they're close friends, and and uh, it was good to talk uh, with Steve about about Izzo as well because he was able to comment on on him as a person, you know, and what his values were. And so I thought that was particularly then. Uh, Perhaps the, the most poignant show was uh, the one with David uh, Halberstadt uh, because 
uh, a year after we did the show, he was uh, tragically killed in an automobile accident. And um, uh, it, he, he's probably one of the most um, magnetic characters that I've ever interviewed. Just a marvelous man, just marvelous man. Well, it comes through in his writing. I mean, I've read, yes. many of us have read quite a few of his books, and he just brings history to life. Yes. And uh, to me, that's the, the fun part about reading history. It isn't this dry stuff. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, what you've dedicated a big chunk of your life to, which is popular culture as an academic discipline. Now, mm -hmm. your doctorate's in English literature. <clears throat> and so how does uh, somebody from the uh, august field of English literature uh, wind up uh, in popular culture? A fair question, um, and it you know the, the the journey is not a not a simple one to explain, but it but it really worked this way. Uh, when I was at Purdue getting my master's degree, one of the faculty members whom I never took a course from but became friends with was um, uh, Ray Brown. Uh, he was really a folklorist, and he was teaching in the English department at uh, at Purdue. Um, and I stayed in touch with him after I left. I, my first teaching position was at the University of Minnesota Morris, which was in West Central Minnesota, a liberal arts campus of the University of Minnesota. And I stayed in touch with Ray. And I saw him at a conference, I think out in my second year at the University of Minnesota Morris, I saw him at a conference in Chicago, and he had told me he had just moved to Bowling Green State and that he was starting something called the Center for the Study of Popular Culture. And I was looking for a place to do my doctoral work. And he encouraged me to apply for the PhD program there in English, which I did. Um, <clears throat> and I went there in the summer, I think it was of 1968, just to test it out to take a course. And then returned to the University of Minnesota Morris. And then the following year, uh, went there to become a doctoral student, a teaching fellow, and immediately was assigned pretty much to the Center for the Study of Popular Culture to work with Ray. And uh, Ray had grandiose plans. He decided to create a new discipline, you know. And uh, it, it's rare that you get to, to work with someone who actually creates a whole new field of study. Um, and he worked hard and long at trying to decide how to name it. But he, but he knew that there was a whole area of cultural studies that were, that were essentially being ignored. Um, and, and his argument was that culture is a continuum and we're ignoring a huge part of what we would consider to be middle class culture in this country. And Ray, being a, a, a folklorist by training, uh, an Americanist by disposition, um, and really a popular culturist by, uh, by probably his commitment to democracy, um, led him to create a field of study where, uh, where others feared to tread, you know, and, and, and there was a, it was an interesting time. I mean, when I look back on that period of time, I doubt that what we did there could ever be accomplished again. I mean, we actually, within a few years, separated from the English department. Originally, uh, everything was connected to the English department. Uh, in 1973, we actually separated out and became a separate department with three faculty members. Small little unit. Uh, but our argument was that um, it was necessary to survive, that in order to grow and to develop, you really had to become separate. So we did separate. Dangerous business, if you think about it, but um, you know, those were interesting times. Um, the late so, 60s, early 70s were tumultuous, to say the they, least. They were in indeed, and, and you might recall that, that uh, shortly after I got to Bowling Green, we had Kent State, mm -hmm. um, and our president was able to keep the institution open at our campus. Um, and keep the National Guard off campus. And so we actually survived that very well. Um, but we had a very, um, a very wise president. And uh, w what I think happened then was people were looking for new avenues of study. And the time was right to sort of open that door, you know, open the windows. Um, and what happened was we developed an undergraduate program first, and then within a year after that, a master's program. And then within a few years after that, a doctoral program in American studies of which popular culture was a part. And then I directed that PhD program for about six years after that, getting it started, getting it moving. Um, that program is, to the best of my knowledge, thriving uh, still to this day. So essentially, we opened doors there. And of course, Ray, Ray was one who saw the bigger picture. And so what he did is he established an international organization, you know, Popular Culture Association. Um, he established a press, the Bowling Green Popular Press, uh, publishing titles. He was really a pioneer in publishing scholarship about popular culture studies. Ray was one who never knew the word no. He, it didn't occur to him. Um, 
uh, give you a quick example. When three of us were graduate students there together, we woke up one morning and decided, you know, there really isn't a journal devoted to the study of popular film. There are a lot of film journals out there. In fact, there were over 100 uh, in, in English, being printed in English. But nothing focusing specifically on popular films. Um, and since we had done a lot of work in popular films, we even tested out the idea by doing a special issue of Ray's Journal, which was the Journal of Popular Culture, on film, and that was a very successful little in-depth section. And that worked so well. We went, we went to Ray, and again, think about the, the, the chutzpah of it all. Three graduate students going to you know, the major professor and saying, we think there's a need for a new journal, and Ray, of course, would say, why not? And so now, from 40 years later, we're still in print, you know, and the Journal of Popular Film became the Journal of Popular Film and Television. We actually started the journal, two of us taught an overload class, I think we got $600 for that, and that was the base for the first issue of the journal. Um, and then, you know, we were selling subscriptions and so on. And we've been fortunate because um, over the years, um, We've been picked up by uh, major publishers. <clears throat> our, our first long-term publisher after Bowling Green was Heldruff Publications, which was the Helen Dwight Reed Educational Foundation. <clears throat> they published our journal and about 40 others. They're a nonprofit. <clears throat> and now more recently, we've been taken over by um, uh, Taylor and Francis, and uh, you know, they're our publisher now. But, but basically, um, we're very pleased uh, with, with the longevity of the journal, but if you think about it again, uh, it was due to somebody like Ray Brown who would say, well, why not? You know, why not try this and see if it works? And some of the things that he tried worked, some didn't. But uh, he did create an international following. Um, I still remember the visitors we had from all over the world coming to see what we were doing in popular culture studies because we really were defining a new discipline. I would actually call it an interdiscipline, which is a little bit of a play on words, but it was, it was more than a discipline but it was certainly interdisciplinary in focus. Um, and uh, people often accuse me of being a cultural anthropologist, which is, <laughs> is I suppose if you're gonna call me something, that's, that's fine. But, but we really were, um, we were really pioneering a new field of cultural studies. That's really what we were doing. If you had to define popular culture in a sentence or two, how, how would you do that? I think it's, it's pretty much all the aspects of, of, of our of our, of our life, of our common culture that are generally, but not always, shared through the mass media. So it's our shared traditions that come down to us, but often electronically, you know, or in, in some way that's mass mediated. Mm -hmm. um, but they are shared common cultural patterns that we all understand. It's not that we necessarily approve of them or necessarily embrace them. It's that this is, this is our shared culture. Um, and it's the shared culture, really, of the middle class. Uh, by and large. So, it doesn't take any special training to, to, to appreciate. You know. So uh, until maybe the 1920s or maybe a little before that when the newspapers uh, started coming out, you know, the penny press, yes. there wasn't American popular culture in that sense. Actually, you could argue that popular culture has been around since the Middle Ages, you could argue. Um, in fact, the, the reason that you might think there wasn't a popular culture is that people didn't make a distinction between cultural forms. They saw them as one. So for example, initially when folklore was introduced as a study or a field of study, it was called popular antiquities which is an interesting phrase. Um, but really, culture was shared widely among all people. I mean, bear in mind, Shakespeare plays, Shakespearean dramas were enjoyed by everyone. Uh, everyone attended them, from the royalty to the peasants. To the and groundlings. they all enjoyed them, and to the groundlings. <laughs> and they all were able to enjoy the same kind of experience. So we, we eventually had a separation. And, and I think what popular culture studies is trying to do, and historically has tried to do, is to bring it back into a continuum. You know, and to, to show us that you know, folk culture uh, and popular culture and what we would normally call high culture are really inter intertwined. They borrow from each other, they share uh, in ways that uh, we, we can clearly see, but that people have chosen to um, close, uh, close the lines between, for whatever reasons they have, often political control or social control. Um, but really, it's a continuum, and, and I certainly try to express that to my students to suggest to them that we live in a world where we can enjoy folk culture, popular culture, and high culture. Why not? Why would we shut the door on any of it? Uh, why not open the door to all of it? Um, and again, the good and the bad, I mean, 95% of everything is, is 
Drek. Drek. Yeah. So <laughs> why are we surprised when we find a television show that doesn't live up to our expectations? I mean, is every symphony ever written wonderful? I think not. You know? <laughs> and I, I, what I'm suggesting is that you know we have to use our critical judgments to judge what is good and what it, what is valuable to us as a cultural experience. But we shouldn't close the door. I mean, I've I've kept the door open, and I'm so pleased. I've learned so many things by keeping the door open. Um, there are a dozen times I could have said, no, I'm not going to pursue that. Uh, I'm not going to go down that road. Um, when everybody else was was studying the more <clears throat> quote, respectable Western writers, I was working hard on the work, on the fiction of Louis L'Amour. Mm -hmm. and, and I did a lot of work uh, on, uh, on L'Amour. And I'm glad I did because I learned a great deal about how a popular storyteller actually works and, and how they succeed. Uh, and to be able to actually get to know Louis L'Amour during his uh, last years. Um, and, and one of the highlights of my, um, my work with Louis was to give a, to give a paper in Baltimore uh, on his fiction and Louis was in the audience. Uh, and I mean, extraordinary, <laughs> extraordinary experience to have him there. Um, but again, I think, you know, had I closed that door, which so many other people had closed, um, I remember um, trying to uh, get a contract to do um, a monograph on his work and, and the publishers at Utah State telling me, well, we don't publish on writers like that. Uh, and of course, you know, that strikes me as odd, you know, and, and so Again, the Ray Brown way of looking at the world is open the door, you know. And, and if, if your study of Louis Namor reveals some interesting things, good. If it doesn't, move on, you know. Uh, well, one of the things that I, I find interesting is how the art community, and I guess that would be considered high culture, um, they have ideas that really lead, lead our culture, lead society, but it, it, the, the lag is years. Uh, for example, a couple of examples. One of them would be, I think, the, the beatnik community in the late 1950s really led to the, the, the hippie community of the 60s and all of the social change that came with that. Um, and we think about Art Deco, for example, which sure. was 1930s. But by the 1950s, the cars that we saw on the roads, the cars that everyone owned, <coughs> were reflective of that, of that styling. In fact, one of the areas that you've studied extensively is the the car business yes uh, one of the things I found interesting in your in your background is that you've served as a consultant to Valvoline and Ford and Audi how many PhDs in English do you think can make that claim <laughs> well, probably not many but <clears throat> but I, I really had a wonderful experience working um, ultimately as a spokesperson for enterprise uh, rent a car you know for a number of years and did satellite uh, radio and television um, you know, uh, interviews. The, you know, uh, you go to a studio and you do a dozen satellite interviews with radio and television stations all across the country. Um, and that was a good experience too because I learned a lot about that side of the business. But, um, but my work with Ford was particularly intriguing. I worked uh, with Ford Motor Company over the years and, um, you know, on things like the, the anniversary edition of the Mustang and so on. But, but, I, but I think the highlight of that work <clears throat> was really writing for Motor Trend. Uh, I was able to get a column uh, in Motor Trend uh, for a couple of years, you know, until they caught up with me. <laughs> <laughs> but I was writing a lot about, you know, um, the way in which the automobile has impacted our culture. I mean, I would argue, and, and a lot of people may dispute this, but I would argue that uh, the automotive technology has probably influenced our culture more than any other technology, including the computer. I cannot think of a single aspect of American life which has not been influenced by the automobile. I mean, um, so when I look at automotive culture, I look at American culture. You know, they're they're equated in my mind. Um, and when you when you look at um, the history of the automobile, it so closely parallels you know the American the American history in a thousand different ways. You mentioned the cars of the fifties, for example. Um, it's important that that you know the whole history of the of the American automotive manufacturing is the battle between form and function. And sometimes form wins out and sometimes function wins out. And certainly in the 50s, form won out. I mean, these cars were elaborately designed. Um, <clears throat> they were overbuilt, if anything else. But what is sometimes missed is that many of the um, architects of the automotive design in the 1950s came out of the aircraft industry during mm -hmm. the war. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at the flight design patterns that a lot of those cars had uh, with the big tail fins, et cetera. They're really, and, and the way in which the dashboards were designed, uh, they're really, um, they're really uh, aeronautical. And, and that's something that is important because it's a kind of a post-World War II reflection back on the war. 
Um, and, and that was true of a lot of those designs during the 50s. And so, now that got tamed by the time we got to the 60s. I mean, they were at the point where you might remember the 1959 Cadillac had a tail fin that was lethal. <laughs> <laughs> you literally bumped up against it. <laughs> well, the thing that to me that's interesting about that is uh, a lot about the 1950s in culture was uh, about an optimism for future. I mean, we had put the depression behind us, the war was behind us. Uh, I think the Cold War was not quite what it became later, but there was the promise of, of a wonderful 21st century where we'd all be you know, flying around like the Jetsons, yes. for example, and right. you do see that reflected in the in the cars. You know, the the uh, the space age uh, kind of that kind of and thing. and and conspicuous consumption. You know, and the fact that look at the way the models change dramatically every year. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, as a child growing up, I could hardly wait to see the new models coming out, and you know, to to be able to see these new designs. Think about the 1956, 1957, and 1958 Chevrolets, and how radically different each of those models were mm -hmm. you know and some of the great classic designs came out of that period too it's still said by many people that the 57 Chevy is the perfect design a blend of form and function so that particular engine the 283 combined with the chassis they put it on the weight distribution to the power it created the perfect balance you know? I had an opportunity to ride around and I think it was a 65 Corvair mm -hmm. convertible ah. And of course, we all know about uh, Ralph Nader and the, and the Corvair. But uh, it, there was something about that experience. I mean, it didn't have the right kind of suspension. It was underpowered. I mean, every possible thing you can imagine that we would see in cars now was not present. But it had panache. Yes, <laughs> I guess yes, is yes, the yes, best yes. way I can describe right. it. <laughs> well, there were a lot of interesting. There was just a, it was an interesting period for automotive design all the way through the '60s, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then the advent of the muscle cars, you know, which were, cars. Over, back. which were overbuilt, you know, and uh, and yet they're back and they're and they're collectible and and so on. So it was just an exciting time. I mean, to think about 1963 and a half, which is when they introduced the Ford Mustang, mm -hmm. the only car ever designed for a generation, you know, of of baby boomers, um, and probably will become one of the most collectible cars ever because there were so many of them made. You know, well, it propelled Lee Iacocca's career. In his book, I think he said that. Uh, Success has many fathers, but failure is an orphan. That's right. <laughs> and uh, he uh, clashed with uh, Henry Ford II, I think, did. Over, over who should properly claim credit for that. That is correct. In fact, I went to the anniversary of the 25th anniversary of, of the Mustang at the Ford headquarters, and his name was not mentioned. Not state. mentioned at all. <laughs> <Not> mentioned. <laughs> now, people also, though, for, sometimes overlook the fact that Lee Iacocca then went to Chrysler, you may mm -hmm. recall, sure. and he was the father of the minivan. So took the baby boomers from the from the Mustang to the minivan. Just a curious transition. Right, I mean, and I, there are, uh, he was sort of the Steve Jobs of his era. In, he really in, was. In, in some ways. Well, I'd like to talk to, to you a little bit too about, uh, about television. Um, television shapes American culture. Uh, maybe not quite as much as it once did in the, in the 60s and 70s when there were three TV channels and everybody was watching mm -hmm. Bewitched at the same time. Uh, but it's still out there. And reality television now, of course, is sort of through the looking glass darkly. Um, what do you think about that? I mean, is there is there anything new under the sun? Is this the same thing as Alan Funt uh, reflecting ourselves in candid camera, in no, a sense? television, though, is, is to the point of being omnipresent. If you think about television, it's got its own national archive, and that's called reruns. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and right. so, you know, when I talk about a common culture, which I mentioned earlier, television still provides us with a view into our common culture. You know, despite the fact that we're getting fragmented messages, you know, that there, there are a lot of cable channels and, and so on, and a lot of uh, programming is to a select subset of, of the mass audience. Um, still, there are common themes. You know, there are common themes that run through them all, and they reflect the common culture ultimately. So I think that even though it's not controlled by just a few networks anymore, the way in which it once was, um, we still have a situation where the common culture is pervasively provided by television um, through current programming, but also through reruns, you know, and um, again, you, you know, cable provides you with the opportunity to visit the huge archive of, of television programming. You can go back and, and, and view episodes of Cheers if you want. You can view episodes of Gunsmoke. You can, and all the opportunities are there for you to experience the history of television. And on the internet television. now, the internet and now the internet. allows you to do that on demand. You know, one of the things I really enjoy is to uh, either 
go on Netflix or, or get it to DVD and I can watch an entire season without commercial breaks or whatever. And, and it's a different kind of viewing experience. Yes. I mean, you, re you really get into, if you watch it from the beginning through the first couple of seasons, you begin to see how the writers develop the characters and, yes. and it's just, the characters sort of take on a life of their own, which is, I think, absolutely fascinating. It's a much better experience than being interrupted by, uh, you know, Alka-Seltzer commercials well, or whatever. Well, people, people, I think, for years ignored the fact that a television series is organic and it develops and the characters change and they grow together as a family. I, I did a lot of research on Gunsmoke, which was, as you might remember, uh, the longest running dramatic program on television, 20 years. Um, and it was an exploration of a unusual family. You know, but it was a family. I mean, Matt, uh, Matt Dillon, and Doc, and Kitty. Um, th these were family members, you know, mm -hmm. and they lived together over 20 years through many different kinds of experiences. And it was a, it was a quite remarkable show. And I got to interview a lot of the directors and writers for that for that show. And it was just an incredible experience as a research opportunity. But um, because that show was so so. Uh, electrifying, I think, in many ways. Well, uh, for, the story I've heard is that part of the reason why it stayed on the air as long as it did and why it was on Sunday nights is because the president of CBS personally enjoyed the show and that was going to stay on the air. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that was his, actually his wife. Oh, it was his wife. Even, he really enjoyed even, the show. Even more important. He wasn't going to change that. <laughs> well, I would be remiss. We only have a few minutes left. Yeah. I, I have to ask you about uh, you know, your career in academic administration. You, know, you, you were an enormously successful professor. I mean, publishing, I think I counted 11, maybe I miscounted books, more journal articles than you can shake a stick at. But you got into you know, kind of running the, running the circus instead of being part of the circus. I, I, uh, I made a, a key decision along the way. Um, I always found myself, even as a faculty member, getting involved in administrative tasks, you know, early on, working for the provost, for example, on enrollment issues, uh, later running the American Culture PhD program as the director of that program. Uh, eventually, I became assistant dean, then later associate dean of arts and sciences at Bowling Green. That was only a part-time job, by the way. It wasn't a full-time job. Um, I still taught a course, et cetera. And so um, decided that, you know, I kept going in and out, in and out of administration over the years, and finally decided, you know, um, I, I enjoy my teaching, but I, I think I can, I can also contribute through administration. And, and I saw things that I didn't like that were going on, and I felt, well, I can probably change those if I work hard enough at it. And so um, I made a decision uh, when I became dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at uh, Northern Michigan to devote full-time to it and, and remained in, in full-time administration then for roughly, well, I guess if you start with my associate deanship, probably uh, a little more than 20, 20 some, 24, 25 years um, and enjoyed every bit of it more or less. Um, I mean, there are downsides to it. Um, but you can actually make a difference. You can actually facilitate. If you work well with other people, um, if you empower other people, together you can do a lot that you could never do by yourself or they could never do by themselves. So creating new programs. Uh, the creative writing program that exists at Northern Michigan University is thriving. I'm glad I was there at the time we created it. Um, I'm glad that it's still doing so well. Um, it's, tr it's creating a whole generation of new writers, uh, and, I, and I like that idea. The Masters of Liberal Studies program, which, which I worked with a group here to create and was able to teach in for several years, it's quite satisfying to see it thrive and, and to see it serve the purpose that it was intended to serve. Um, and, and again, to, 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 as an administrator, come into an institution like St. Norbert and say, well, we have a wonderful men's hockey program. Why is it that we don't have a women's hockey program? And then to actually go to the first game uh, of the women's hockey program. And I, that's satisfying. Now, again, you don't do these things by yourself. You don't do them independently of, of a group of people who are like-minded and who want to accomplish good things. But you can make a difference. And administration, that's the satisfying part of administration is to see. Now, some ideas are good ideas and they live on. Others are bad ideas and they don't live very long. <laughs> so uh, administrators have some good ideas and some bad ideas. And, and generally, if a good administrator listens to the critics, they'll be able to help separate out the good from the bad and, and not pursue the bad. Well, Mike, unfortunately, we're out of time. I mean, I had well, a million you. other questions I, I could have asked you, but, well, you know, the, the... Thank you for having me on as a guest. Guy. Well, thank you for being here, and thank you for creating the show. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed our show today. Until next time, I'm Kevin Quinn. Best wishes for good conversations from St. Norbert College. Thank you.